Hey, Easy Agent Proers. Welcome to uh, this episode of In the Lead. I know it's been a while since we've got one of these out. I've been a bit sick and we've been launching, you know, version two of lead sites, which you can now check out on the site. It's pretty cool. We got 10 cool apps to check out there. But today we're going to be diving deep again into the world of real estate lead generation. I um, mean, I've got our expert, uh, in-house expert, actually, Steve Maxwell on the line with me. We're going to dive into how to 3x your website with landing pages, where you can put those landing pages on your site, uh, what you can do with them. He's built hundreds of sites, generated thousands and thousands of real estate leads. Um, he, we, we hired him. He's an expert in SEO. Um, he, he's probably talked with a few of you about your plans for SEO and your plans for lead gen. Uh, Steve, welcome to the show. Morning, Tyler. Yeah, so um, I know it's a little bit early over there in, in uh, Albuquerque, but we're going to do the best we can here. <laughs> um, Sounds good. So we want to dive in today. Uh, we've been collecting a lot of websites from our listeners uh, via the autoresponder, and the biggest problem I see with them is is lack of landing pages and flow to those landing pages. So even if they are getting traffic, uh, landing pages are the best way to convert that traffic. So with you today, I want you to sort of break down uh, three ways that they can maybe implement landing pages to their website and you know segment their traffic to those pages so that they can start getting more conversions, build their business, and make sure that their website, you know, a profit generating thing. Uh, to their business. So with that being said, let's sort of start with seller leads. And uh, why don't you give us just sort of a, in your viewpoint, like the best ways to maybe capture seller leads with landing pages and some of the things you can do off of that. Sure. I think one of the best ways to capture seller leads is obviously through, you know, paid methods. You can use a paid platform um, to drive traffic directly to your landing pages. I mean, that landing page will have a singular function and then the user can complete the function and then you acquire the lead. Um, I think one of the good ways, especially with lead sites, is we have set up on there already with the seller um, home valuation tool, where somebody can come directly to the page, um, request a home valuation, and then you acquire that you know, through that lead source. Another good paid, I think, platform would be um, you know, Google. You can use Google Pay Per Click, drive traffic directly from there. Same functions, just a different advertising platform, but same end result. Um, so two great ways to, uh, to, to drive traffic directly from your site. Also, your general site traffic. I mean, if you're going to get traffic coming to your homepage and other parts of your site, um, through calls to action and through you know direction of that traffic, you can move them onto that individual landing page and then acquire them you know as a potential uh, lead as well. So let's let's dive into that a bit more. Uh, what is a call to action specifically? Like, how how does that look for you? You've built sites. Um, you've seen a lot of them. Like, what's that look for, and what's working right now with those calls to action? I think calls to action, what they do for a site is, I mean, they, they give it a real clear message when a user comes to that site. So I call it clarity of message, right? It's just huge. That user needs to know why they're there, the activities that they can do, and then the pathways that they can get, I think, to that information that they're seeking. Because remember, majority of your traffic, they're going to be coming off of a, they're asking a question, right? They're using Google as that source to, hey, I have a specific question that I need answered. And once they come off the search engine, now they're on your site to have that question answered. So that's what the calls to action do. They give them those clear activities and the clear, again, paths to go back into your tools or information to, to answer their query. Yeah, that's in. So if you're looking to answer that question in a really clear way, what, was that, what would that design look like on this? Let's say, let's use two examples. Let's use the homepage and let's use a blog post. Let's say, um, we'll go up to the blog post first. Let's say they find your blog post about a first time home buyer um, on Google and yeah. now they're on your site and you know they're, they're looking to, I guess my example falls apart because we're talking about seller leads and a first time home buyer. <laughs> but let's just say that first time home buyer is trying to sell their house. Uh, what would that call to action look like on a blog post? So the call to action on a blog post would, would simply be, you know, for to prompt somebody to get the home value, you know, analysis. So you can have something like, um, want to know the price of your home? And then they click a button, which would be then a graphic or a textual presentation, and that would direct them into your Where landing page. Where would you page. put that button on the blog page? Typically, um, especially like on lead sites, we run those across the top consistently. Mm -hmm. um, you also have calls to action going down the right side of the screen. And then within a blog post, because again, while that user is consuming your blog post, um, which I think falls into more of the, the marketing side, the content marketing side, right. they're already engaged. They're already getting an actual value from their site. And as a marketer, we see that that is where the users become um, responsive to your calls to action. And mm -hmm. again, it's really just a graphical presentation of something that they can click 
and it's telling them a clear activity they can do, and then they're directed to that activity. Right. So I think that's something that people could really like. From the sites I saw from our study, we've got like two or three hundred of them now in my email. Like. If you take a graphic like Steve's talking about, and I think you said something like get a free home value or find out like home prices are rising, you know, mm -hmm. figure out if yours is worth something that you might want to sell it for. Um, and then you're saying put that um, in like a header up top and then in the actual content itself and then maybe on the sidebar too? Correct. Yeah. And so the placement of those is always going to be one, of course, yes, within the written content. Um, another place you can have an always running call to action like we do at the very top of the sites where the user consistently sees that particular um, you know, call to CTA. And then you, the sidebar, that's always a great place as well because it's a constant that runs as they browse the entire site. So again, the more times somebody sees a call to action, if that is something that there, if that's something that's going to answer their query, um, then they're more likely to you know, respond to it after viewing it in their multiples. Yeah, I mean, that's what we see on, on our site, Easy to Pros blog too, is that like, you know, you, the header bar that gets a message across and maybe one to three percent of people click that and you have a sidebar and maybe another three to five percent click that and then yeah. in the content, um, that's where you get your most traction actually, uh, is the, the calls action off that. So let's go back then to that home page example because I think a lot of sites are confused with their home pages. Um, what are sort of the, like, we're in seller leads right now, but what calls to action do, do agents need to have on their home page to get people to certain por portions of their site? Well, I think you need to consider always, you know, why are people coming to my site, right? And so they're going to be there for one of three reasons. Typically, they're either buying a home, selling a home, or they need information on either of those two processes, right? So the minute they get to your home page, you need to have those clear pathways, which, you know, you offer those through the calls to action. So, like, for example, on ours, we use three large calls to action always on the front, and we see that they convert really well, um, and that is, you know, buying a home, selling a home, and then get information, which is seller, or um, I should say, tips, real estate tips on how to, you know, do either of those processes better um, or, you know, many questions within both. But that, So why does that work compared to, like, like, these are just big ginormic graphics you're talking about, big buttons they can click to, you know, if they're selling, getting their seller landing page, buyer getting a buyer landing page. Why does that work compared to maybe just sort of like, you know, like someone would argue it's in the menu, they can find it anyway. What's What's the difference between those two philosophies? I think proact it's proactive offering is what it is. So you're not passively waiting for somebody to explore your menu and then your submenu and maybe even a submenu of that. Um, and then remember too, the majority of people they're coming on mobile. So you're going to have you know sixty yeah. to eighty percent of your site traffic on a mobile device. They're not going to hop in the menu and start exploring that right off the yeah, bat. Menus are they're terrible on mobile. <laughs> exactly. And the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to scroll. They're going to flick with their finger and they're going to move that page. And if you don't have those large calls to action, um, you run into that point of Users online nowadays, they have a very low attention span. If they can't find the information they're seeking or the path to get there, they're going to hit the back button and leave and go somewhere else where they can. So, like, before we get into some more, like, actionable things with landing page, like, what, what's a good percentage of your traffic you should get, um, like, just raw numbers, this converts to this many leads, uh, traffic to, or visitors, I guess, to be more specific, to actual leads? I think you're looking at between you know one and five percent mm -hmm. um, conversion of your overall traffic. Typically, um, a lot of people you know they're down around 0 0.5, 0 0.2, yeah. 0 0.1, just because of, I think poorly designed sites. You have traffic come, um, the people that, that are coming that you know to get their query answered, it's not able to be answered fast enough. And that's something I think to keep in mind. It's very important is the speed by which you can answer their question. If you can't supply them with that information very quickly, again. Especially on a mobile device, I think that online mentality, that online ADD sets in, and they're going to hit the back button, they're going to leave, and uh, you know you're not going to have that chance to get them into your content where you can give them that value and then acquire them as a lead. Well, that's really interesting too, because if you take like three percent or like everyone wants to focus on SEO and traffic, like those are our two biggest requests for blogs. But at the end of the day, like if you're getting 02 percent of your traffic to convert to leads. Or I know people getting even less than that, people with massive traffic and they just don't have any lead capture and we're trying to help them. But like, uh, if you're not, fo the, the best thing to focus on at most realtors is the conversion aspect because traffic building, you know, you just get sucked into it because it's fun. You know, the conversion stuff is a bit, eh, you know, you have to make graphics, you have to think about how people move through the site and maybe look at Google Analytics. It's not as fun really, but it's, it's crucial because in order to get, let's say you boost, by listening today, you put a graphic on your blog sidebar and in your blog, and that goes to a landing page like the yeah. seller landing page. Like you can 
theoretically go from something like 0.2% of your traffic converting to one to 2% of your traffic converting. And that's, it's like a 10x multiplier, where if you, you know, tried to 10x your traffic, you're going to, instead of just putting two graphics <laughs> in a landing yeah. page on your site, you're going to have to spend like tons of money on Google and do like just tons of blog. Like, like the, I think that's something that agencies need to understand is that, you know, th these are two things and both really matter. And sometimes the low hanging fruit is the conversion. Uh, Absolutely. And, and I, I think too that just starting off, I mean, why not have the conversion aspect already met? It's, it's not a hugely costly venture to get it. I mean, really all you're doing, you're creating a site that has a clear message, calls to action, has well-placed data, and is engaging for your user. I mean, why not have that met from day one as you build your traffic? It just wouldn't make sense to me to have something that's low converting for you know, virtually the same effort and same time. When, and also, too, I, I think it's important to remember later on, if you don't have everything, I think, with your site set from the start, you're going to have to do a complete site change. And a lot of times you're going to lose, I think, a lot of SEO juice along with that because the structure of your site changes, the placement of your data changes. And so why not just from day one have it set up correctly for what turns out you know, to be a relatively low time and cost investment? It's just, it, to, me, to me, it doesn't make sense because yeah. you're going to be losing leads in the long run. So. I, I hear in like about that SEO point. We you'll see on Easy Agent Pro proper. Uh, we actually changed from a Facebook no from a, a WordPress comment system to a Facebook comment system, and all of our rankings like we went down a little bit in the rankings. We're slowly starting to climb back up, but that that little code change we're talking about changing maybe twenty lines of code on the bottom of each post. That that even just that code change itself like just dramatically impacts you know what you're doing online. Uh, for Google. Yeah, and I, I think Google, they, they do not like change. They don't like consistent change within your site and your, you know, major, and so you're talking about it's such a minor point, right, with the, with the comment system, but imagine changing your entire site structure and the entire way, you know, information flows to your site and users browse it, it's, it's going to affect your ranking. So, yeah, absolutely. Cool. So let's dive into sort of a second point here. So let, let's take um, how you can use Facebook uh, in landing pages together to sort of like traffic, uh, get leads from traffic that maybe is content driven or blog related. Do you have any tips for that in landing pages? Yeah. I mean, you can absolutely use Facebook. Like, for example, I, I think the most important thing with um, any of the social media platforms, especially Facebook, is building an audience that is actually engaged, right? I think the common mistake is to simply just post to your Facebook page where you have 25 followers. Uh, nobody's really listening, and I think at that point it becomes a conversation with yourself. But when you take the time to actually build an audience and engage your audience, then you can put in ways to direct them to things like your landing pages, and you can bring traffic back to your site. And it's not just traffic being tricked or being you know forced to click something or forced to register somewhere. It's actually engaged traffic coming back. So I think social media, of course, Hugely important thing, of course, build an audience that is engaged and that wants to be there and wants to listen. Right. And so, like, once you have that audience, let's let's talk about, let's say, Facebook retargeting. Um, yeah. What would you do with Facebook retargeting people who, and for those of you that don't know, you can put a pixel on your site and then your ads on Facebook can actually be shown to people who've already been on your site. Uh, what are ways that you would show them things, maybe blog posts, maybe other uh, page on your site that then capture lead with um, capture leads? Absolutely. So retargeting, absolutely. yeah, you have the retargeting pixel on your site. Anybody who visited it, just like Tyler said, you know, they're going to get an advertisement um, sent to them through the Google Ad Network. And really what that's going to do is going to decrease your PPC cost. So you're continually running these ads. I think we've seen this with Easy Agent Pro, right? We had some really good success running, you know, retargeting campaigns because, again, they're all people that are familiar with your brand. They're familiar with your site, your look, I mean, everything. So they're seeing advertisements consistently follow them. And then they're able to click those ads and go to your landing pages right from a paid advertising platform. So what and I landing think, pages would you have them go to? Oh, sure. So I think one of the ones, obviously, is the home value, home valuation mm -hmm. tool, right? You can direct people to there. You can also bring people right into your search. And then within the search, you have the ability to prompt with, you know, calls to bring in information there. So you can have, you know, different forms to fill out or to continue searching or to just register and save searches. Right. That would be for, obviously, for, um, for buyers. Cool. 
Yeah, so you can you can drive people straight from the uh, ads on Facebook, on Google, um, retargeting on both those platforms back to your landing pages for sellers. Uh, we just released a new feature where you can actually lock down any blog post or IDX listing. So on Facebook, if you're looking to you know promote your newest listing, you just put hashtag lock behind the URL, and you have a high converting landing page that you know people can go straight from Facebook to that landing page, and you don't have to set it up, um, which I think is the biggest problem with with some ads on Facebook right now that I see from agents, they're running them straight to just wide open websites. And you really need to control that ad funnel to have it go from an ad to a locked down page where they, you know, either on lead sites where that's an actual landing page yeah. or on your, you know, IDX with someone else where it's locked down. Um, because if you're not getting that ROI from the retargeting to a lead capture, it just sometimes breaks down the, the percentage of your, your overall traffic that really converts to leads for you. Yeah, and I think the big thing on there too is people, when they're being directed off a of pay-per-click, they need to be going to a page with a singular function. So they don't need to be going to the home page of a website say right they need to go to a page where they have a clearly defined activity and then they get a clear result at the end and that is where you see pretty good conversion but to, I think to bring somebody directly to the home page of a site it's not going to convert so well so um, yeah so let's uh, let's take a look then at sort of SEO we talked about it a little bit earlier but how how would you Let's say someone sets up their landing page, they conversion optimize their blog, their home page. Yeah. Um, then they start running some maybe Facebook retargeting with, you know, lockdown listings, lockdown blog posts, lockdown first time home buyers. Um, so that's that's two good things that really would impact the results we're seeing, at least from the examples we get from our, sure. our audience. Uh, what? How does SEO play into this? What are things people can do? Uh, what are things they can do to convert that traffic once they get it with landing pages? In your opinion. Okay. So, I mean, obviously, you know, once they bring back, you know, the, the, the traffic coming from PPC or whatever, they do your conversion process, you get that part of the lead. But I think the, the thing that I want to touch on with the PPC essentially would be this. Um, you know, if you're looking at lead quality, right, and we're looking in terms, okay, what's going to be my highest type of converting traffic? And I think that definitely comes from organic traffic, right? You know, bringing in organic traffic to your site. Because if you had, a, I think, a scale of one to 10, right, and you had PPC down there as a one to two type lead with maybe an 18 month um, cycle where maybe you're going to convert that person within 18 months with lead quality. But you're looking at something where like what we see, right, with, with our own leads that we generate with our company through, um, you know, actual organic type leads, you're looking at a very high conversion rate. And you're looking at a customer that's engaged that has already kind of pre-qualified you through the content that you've created. And then, you know, they're now approaching you to have that conversation about your service or about your product. So, yeah, yeah go I, ahead. I agree. I think the metrics we're tracking it's a, it's a three to four times differential like if someone finds us from google they're three to four times more likely to do business with us um just from all the data we're tracking where if we get them from ppc it's a bit colder relationship you can supplement that coldness with some blogging and testimonials you know that build trust but it's just it's just not as organic yeah and i think you consumer basis too you have to keep in mind they become conditioned um, to certain forms of advertising. So I think PPC, you'll see a lot of these models that their entire main vein of their advertising, or I should say their marketing plans, focus around PPC. Let's just simply run PPC and that is that is it, right? Um, but I think, the, again, the consumer bases, they're very conditioned to advertisements, they're conditioned to looking past them. Um, and that's where content marketing comes in to draw in a different kind of lead. Because so, again, so yeah. like, I think people would agree with you on that, but they're probably going to be saying, okay, Steve, but what do I do to get those results that then supplement my PPC or like just get me leads in general? So like, what would be your like three-step, five-step guide to do this now and you'll get some SEO results and then you can double down on that in the future? So, I mean, first thing is, I mean, the overall concept would be never neglect your, your organic strategy. I mean, never neglect that. You can run PPC, you can bring in leads through there because you need action immediately, but never neglect the organic side of that. And what is, the, what is an organic um, plan actually break down into? I mean, from my perspective, to take it down to a, a full would always start with keyword research. Come up with a map that you're going to attack. And then after keyword research, you want to create content based upon those keywords. And then the third step is always the marketing aspect where you are now going to take the content you created, market it, draw people back in, um, you know, and, and please Google with all of the um, you know, calls that, that they need to, to yeah, rank. Yeah, that's, that's all. So how do you, 
I, I know you've taken a few of our clients through this. How do you recommend people attacking the keyword research? Like, do you have them find 10 keywords, 500 keywords? What's your method there? Typically right there, you know, you want to start with between 75 and 150, right? You want to have a good amount of keywords. And here's the way that I attack. And here's, I think, the best way for small business. Because remember, your site's not going to have a ton of SEO juice and authority in the beginning, especially with, you know, backlinking coming from other, you know, authority sites. So you want to attack some longer tail keywords first. Get ranked within those. You know, start to build up your site's authority. Could you start give to build an example up the of a maybe long tail keyword? I know you're in Albuquerque, so like of an Albuquerque real estate website. Like what would be a good long tail keyword? Sure. So, for example, I would never do something like Albuquerque Homes for Sale right off the bat, right? It would mm -hmm. be something that would be a tough keyword group to go for. So you might want to do something like Albuquerque Horse Properties for Sale um, or Albuquerque, you know, Riverfront Properties for Sale. Something, again, yes, a little bit longer, but a lot quicker and easier to rank for. Right. And then, so with, so you have 75 to 150 of those longer keywords. Um, what do you do now that you have that list? So now that I have that list, and I, and I think also too it's important to talk about you know when you're qualifying, what's a major keyword group and what's not, right? So I, I think the best part is to look up some of the, the big keywords in your area, see what the traffic is, and you're going to know, okay, these are the major categories, and so I'm competing in these longer tail ones, which may have a third or a fourth or even a sixteenth of the traffic that the major ones have, but that's completely okay because what we're doing here is we're piecing together traffic versus trying to go after it all at once, right? But the piece together traffic, it's, it's funny because you end up appearing pretty much everywhere in search, just like we do, right? We rank for things like Bisbo letter, you know, yeah. collateral searches is what I call them. So I think piecing together those collateral searches, you know, into one large traffic group becomes a very good place to be because you've already taken care of pretty much every single place that somebody's going to be searching for all these collateral type needs um, with, with real estate. Yeah, that's that's really so. So you've you know you found those keywords. You've made like one post or one page on your site that's dedicated to answering that query that someone's typing into Google. Um, so now, how do we we go from that point to you know making the page? To is there anything else you recommend SEO wise, or do you just focus on conversion at that point? I think you know obviously creating the content, right? You know you you come back to some very basics of the basics, which is on page SEO. You want to make sure you know your on page SEO is correct. We're matching you know the title of your page to your H1 to mm -hmm. you know your H1 tags on the page and one percent keyword density standard, um, and then you know linking out to other articles that are you know relevant within that within that category. So I mean the very basic of the basic, yes, that needs to be paid attention to because that is how Google reads your page. I mean they the bot comes and it reads it in or the spider comes and it reads it in a certain format. And if it's not formatted in that way, you're going to lose a lot of the SEO effect that you would right. have. School says, well, what's this page really about? I, I just don't know. I can't tell. I need it in a format I can read. So that's the second component is not only so you identify, you create. But during that creation process, it's a, really a simple checklist that I send people. It's about a 14-point checklist. And all it does is detail, here's how to structure your page so Google can, can, can read it. And yeah. that's you know, step two to moving in. Yeah, and that's that's the only way we've seen SEO results ever work is you know building those little blocks that over yeah. you know a month over two months just turn into something enormous. Um, so then, okay, let's say you're let's say you're getting traffic from like a few of these small blocks. Uh, what can you do on those pages with the calls to actions, with you know maybe linking to locked pages, linking to landing pages to convert more of those people coming from Google to email leads, to full leads, uh, to buyer leads, to seller leads. Absolutely. So again, that goes back you know, like you're right to the call to action conversation where now somebody's there, they're engaged in your content, now they're listening, right? And that's the huge difference is you have a listening audience at that point. And during that time while they're engaged in listening, now you can put your products or services in front of them and with the calls to action pages, yes, link out to your home value analysis page. If it's a article that was directed at sellers, they're there, they're reading, now you can prompt them. Right? And you're going to get a higher response rate for your conversion. You could also use our lock feature, create actual locked pages right, with content behind it, maybe guides, um, potentially you know, tips that the general public can get on your site. And people are more than willing to proceed past those and give information to get. Why? Because they're listening, because they're engaged. You pre-qualified right. yourself. So. I mean, that's what we've seen. I think we've, we have um, some flyer templates on our site, and we just link to a downloaded version of that. 
And yeah. I think we've collected something like 6,000 email leads through that. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's that's the real strategy that works to say, let's go back to Albuquerque Riverfront Properties, um, get then, you know, a download of your 10 things you need to consider before buying a house on the river because otherwise yeah. you get flooded or something yeah. like that. And then you link to, you know, uh, just using lead sites, you could link to a page that's locked down. Um, you can make a landing page and make a downloadable collateral with some tools if you don't quite have a lead site yet. Um, but that's that's the way that we convert the most. Like you can have sidebar call to action, you have a header bar calls to oh, action, but that, that download for a bonus of what they're already looking for converts like crazy. Yeah, because you're really just expanding upon that conversation more. You're just taking the conversation to the next step and it's, it, it's completely relating to what you're talking about. So yeah, completely makes sense for anything crazy. Yeah, that's cool. So. Um, that, that's like three really great things. We'll, we'll write that up on thanks for sharing those, but we'd like to shift gears sort of at the end of this and like, just ask like, everyone we have on the show, like a few favorite questions. So like, is, are there any books that you've read recently that you'd recommend to people or, or find yourself reading again and again? You know, the ones I read, I mean, just time and time again, obviously are HubSpot. Um, I mean, they have just some great, their library on there is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are really, I think for SEO wise. Um, there are also some some great blogs out there that you know just have really good SEO information. I mean, again, with us, even though we're an SEO company, even though you know it's something that we do day in day out, you can never learn enough. You've never learned it all. Right. It's ever changing. Um, so yeah, HubSpot would be my recommendation. You know, you can log right on there, just check out a wealth of, of information, readme's and PDFs. Yeah, they have. I, I love their infograph. I think they do infographics on Tuesday or something, and there's just fantastic breakdowns of of awesome stuff. So, uh, yeah, thanks for coming on the show, Steve, and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. I'm sure people will, will love it. I'll break down this stuff and, and link it up. So if you're listening on the podcast or on the YouTube channel, be sure to click back to the site. I'll, uh, bullet point stuff so you can just copy paste it and implement it into your business. Hopefully three X your website traffic conversion, because that's what today's been all about. So, uh, thanks for your time, Steve. No problem. Thank you, Tyler. All right. Have a good one. You too.